Okay, we are about to start. Welcome in this beautiful hall of the Academy building. My name is uh, Tom Groothuis. I'm a professor in behavioral biology at the Groningen Institute for Evolutionary Life Sciences at this university. But what is more important is who is the speaker of tonight? Now, that speaker is uh, Professor Duketkin, and he is a professor in evolutionary biology and animal behavior at the University of Louisville in the USA. And his main interest is the evolution of social behavior. And he, in addition to that, he has also a strong interest in the history of science. And tonight he will sort of integrate both and tell you really from the inside um, about a very interesting story on the history and the current developments of research on what he called domestication. Now, why is domestication so interesting for us? Now, he will talk about domestication of foxes, but as you know, the human species has domesticated many other animal species. So they, these species are really very important for us and actually they might have influenced our own evolution. Apart from that, the insight we can get in studying domestication gives us a really fundamental insight in how genes actually influence our behavior and the behavior of, of all our animals and how evolution can change those behaviors. So what was found in uh, several domestication processes is that you, if you select for one type of behavior, say tameness, then you also select for a whole array of other behaviors sort of automatically. You get them freely together. So that means you get changes in aggressive behavior, sociability, uh, you, you get differences in collaboration, uh, you get differences in cognitive behaviors. So that tells us a little bit actually how genes shape behavior and how genetic networks are sort of selected by uh, evolution. So from that sense, domestication has sort of, insight in domestication has important applied aspects but it also has uh, important uh, sort of fundamental aspects on actually how gene, genetic networks and of course experience shape behavior and all the, also other traits. So what was found, for example, is that if you select on tameness, you also select on morphology. So you select not only on that the uh, animals become more tame, but that they also get a more cute sort of appearance, aspects that we really like because we have a sort of innate tendency to find morphology that sort of links to the morphologies of babies, um, and big eyes, flat noses, we like those very much and actually that uh, it seems as if if you select for tameness you also indirectly select for those morphologies which is a very intriguing phenomenon. Now, Lee is actually the best person to tell us about this. Uh, he is very, very active in translating uh, science to the general public. He wrote almost 10 books uh, translating this uh, for the, for the uh, general public. Uh, he wrote a couple of textbooks which are heavily used in universities for undergraduates. Uh, he has been invited for, I think, over 100 universities to talk for the general public. So he's really the, the guy to tell you and give you more insight, all the more because the book he wrote uh, on which this talk is based has been written by another author as a co-author and she was really uh, involved in this long-term research. So you will get a story of research in progress. Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, and um, it's a delight to be here. I had a chance to walk around your lovely city today. Um, delightful, besides the rain, it was, it was, it was great, and, um, and I have been looking forward to this talk very much. So 
I'm going to start off with a question, which is, suppose that you could build the perfect dog. What would be the key ingredients in your recipe? Well, you definitely want cute, maybe floppy ears and a curly tail that wags in anticipation whenever you're near. You want loyal, you want intelligent, and you want unconditional love. The thing is that you do not need to build this animal because for the last six decades, a dedicated team of Russian geneticists have been building it for you. The perfect dog, except like you might guess from the title of the talk, it's not a dog, it's a fox, a domesticated fox. They built it in the minus 40 degree winters of Siberia, and they built it in the blink of an eye in terms of evolutionary time. A hundredth of the time it took our ancestors to domesticate wolves into dogs. This is my friend and colleague, Ludmila Trut. A few weeks ago, Ludmila turned 85 years old. And every day, including today, for the last 59 years, she has led what's come to be known as the silver fox domestication experiment. And for the last seven of those years, I've had the pleasure and the honor of working with Ludmila to try and tell this story to as broad an audience as possible. So I'm going to tell you about foxes that will melt your hearts and lick your ears, just like this guy did five seconds after they put him into my arms in Siberia. But more than that, I'm going to tell you about fundamental science that has reshaped the way that we think about this process of domestication. And domestication is important not only in terms of its inherent interest to biologists, but because when we domesticated species, we changed our own evolutionary trajectory. We would have gone down a very different path as humans if we had not domesticated animals and plants. So for the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you about this long-term experiment in domestication. We'll talk about the science. We'll talk about some political intrigue that was involved in the early years of the experiment. And we'll even talk about a few human fox love stories. So the experiment starts with this fellow here, Dmitry Belayev. In the late 1930s, Belayev was, was an undergraduate student at a place called the Ivanova Agricultural Academy outside of Moscow. And while he was there, he studied genetics. And because it was an agricultural college, he had all sorts of interactions with many, many domesticated species. When he graduated, like almost every Soviet male of that era, he went and fought in World War II for four years. When he came back, he got a position as a research scientist at a place known as the Central Research Lab for Fur Breeding Animals, also in Moscow. And they worked with all sorts of fur breeding animals. But the two most important by far were foxes and mink. And the reason those were so important was that in the early 40s and throughout that decade, the Soviet Union was essentially starving to death. They desperately needed Western currency coming into the country. And fox fur and mink fur were two of the very few reliable sources of Western currency coming into the country. And it was while Belayev was at the Central Research Lab that he came up with the idea that would eventually turn into 
the silver fox domestication experiment. And here's how it started. Belayev knew from his own interactions with domesticated species, and also from his reading of Darwin's book about this topic, that many domesticated species share a whole suite of characteristics. So for example, they tend to have floppy ears. They tend to have curly tails. They tend to have low stress hormone levels. They tend to have juvenileized body and facial features. They tend to have lots of variation in their coat color. And they tend to have a longer reproductive period than their wild ancestors. Not every domesticated species has every one of those characteristics, but most domesticated species have most of those characteristics. So much so that today we refer to that whole suite of traits, the floppy ears and the curly tails and the juvenileized facial features and so on. We refer to that as the domestication syndrome. And Belayev thought about this and he thought, you know, this is really odd because our ancestors domesticated species for all sorts of different reasons. Some species, like horses, we domesticated for transportation. Others, we domesticated as food sources. And yet others, we domesticated for protection and companionship. And yet, no matter what we domesticate them for, they tend to have all these characteristics in the domestication syndrome. Why? And Belayev's hypothesis, and at the time it was fairly radical, was this, that the one thing that our ancestors always needed, regardless of what they were domesticating for, transportation or food or protection, the one thing they always needed was to be working with an animal that not, did not try to bite their heads off. And so he hypothesized that the early stages of all domestication events involved our ancestors choosing the calmest, tamest, most pro-social towards human animals. He further hypothesized that somehow or another, and he didn't know how, all those other things, the floppy ears and the curly tails and the low stress hormone levels, all of those came along for the ride if you just choose on tame, pro-social to human behavior. And he decided that he would try and test this idea in real time using the foxes that he had come to know so well at the Central Research Lab. And his idea was basic. Ideally, he would test hundreds of animals every year. And he would choose the calmest, most friendly to human animals and breed those. When their pups grew up, he would test them, and he would see who was the friendliest towards humans. And then they would breed for the next generation, year after year after year. Every foxes breed once a year, so a year is a generation. And he would do this over and over, and he would see, was he actually getting more pro-social animals? And was he starting to see those other characteristics that we see in domesticated species? That was the idea. But he had a problem, and it was a big problem, because any experiment like this in domestication is, by its very nature, an experiment in genetics. But at this time, in the Soviet Union, it was illegal to do modern genetics. And the reason for that is this person right here, Trofim Lysenko. Lysenko was a charlatan, a fraud, a pseudoscientist who had risen up not only in the scientific ranks of the Soviet Union, but in the political ranks. And what Lysenko claimed was that a long disproven idea for the biologists in the audience, something known as the inheritance of acquired characteristics, long disproven, Lysenko said that was in fact true, and that it better lined up with Soviet philosophy. And he called Western geneticists saboteurs, spies, wreckers, 
He rose up in the scientific hierarchy to become one of the most important people in that hierarchy. But he also rose up in the political hierarchy. Here is Lysenko giving one of those talks where he's calling Western geneticists saboteurs and wreckers. And you can see on the right-hand side, there's Stalin. Lysenko was truly Stalin's right-hand man in science, in science. And when Lysenko finished this fire-breathing speech, Stalin stood up and yelled out, bravo, comrade Lysenko. Because of Lysenko, thousands of Soviet geneticists lost their jobs. Hundreds were thrown into prison and a few dozen were murdered and their crime was being Western, doing Western Mendelian genetics. This is the environment in which Belayev is coming up with his idea for the domestication experiment. But Belayev is a guy who not only fought in World War II, but rose up to become a major for his bravery. And he wasn't scared of Lysenko, despite the fact that he knew better than almost anybody how dangerous it was to do genetics under Lysenko, because his older brother, 20 years older, was a rising star in genetics. And he was one of those couple of dozen people who was murdered by Lysenko's thugs for doing genetics. But Belayev decided he was going to do this experiment. He would be careful because he knew eventually it would involve lots of people, but he was going to do it. First, he does a little pilot experiment in Estonia, working with a colleague of his. And they only test a couple of dozen foxes every year, and they choose the ones that are most friendly to humans. And they do this for a few years, very small sample size, but the results are promising, promising enough to think about doing a full-blown experiment. And Belayev gets the chance to start that full-blown experiment in 1958, when he gets a position as vice director at a major new institute in biology in a place called Novosibirsk, which is in Siberia. What happened was that the Russian government had cleared out a gigantic chunk of Siberian forest and built a place called Akadem Gordak, the academic village. It housed about two dozen world-class science institutes, everything from chemistry and physics to computer science to the biology institute that Belayev was now vice director of. So he's going to move to Siberia. And now he's going to have the resources and the power to start a full-blown fox domestication experiment. But what he's not going to have, because of all of his administrative duties there, is the time to be the person to lead this day after day after day. He could supervise, but he needed a young scientist who would take the lead and do this work day after day, year after year after year. So right before he leaves Moscow to move to Siberia, he goes on the hunt for this person. And he visits Moscow State University, one of the most beautiful and also one of the finest universities in the world. And he talks to a colleague there who studies animal behavior. And he tells him what he wants to do. Test hundreds of foxes every year. Choose the most friendly ones. Breed them. See if his hypotheses hold water. One of the people that comes in to interview with him is 25-year-old Ludmila. She's an undergraduate just finishing up. This interview is in late 1958, but Ludmila remembers it like it happened yesterday. The first thing that she noticed when she went in to talk to Belayev was that this time in, in Soviet science was very patriarchal. But Belayev immediately treated her, an undergraduate woman, as an equal. And that really stuck with her. And he explains the experiment. We're going to test hundreds of foxes. Choose the calmest, tamest ones. We'll see, do we get 
changes in their behavior, and do we get those other changes, floppy ears and curly tails and all those other things. And Lumil is fascinated by what she's hearing. But Baleo says, hold on a minute. You need to know that even though by the late 1950s, Lysenko was not quite as dangerous as he used to be, if he decided to make an example of them, he could still throw them in prison. Lumila knew that. Everybody who was a scientist knew that. But it meant a lot to her. The Bileyev stopped her and said, think about this. The other thing that she remembers him telling her is, this is an experiment in evolution. It could take five years, 10 years, 20 years. It could take your whole life before we find anything interesting. I've done this pilot experiment. I think this is a good idea, but I don't know. But she's hooked. Belayev offered her the position. Six months later, Ludmila and her husband and their six-month-old daughter are on a train ride from Moscow to Siberia to start the silver fox domestication experiment. From the first day that Ludmila has been involved in the experiment, her motto comes from the famous Little Prince story, where the fox tells the little prince, you become responsible forever for what you have tamed. So she gets to Siberia, to Akadema Gordak, where Belayev's institute is. And she's ready to start. But while Belayev has money and power, he has not yet built an experimental farm where they can do the fox work. So for the first few years of the experiment, Ludmila is going to have to find someplace else to begin the work. So the first year that she's involved, she's basically going on trains all around the Soviet Union to fox farms where they breed foxes for their fur to see if she can work there on a domestication experiment. There are hundreds of these farms all over the country. They're all owned by the government because there's so much money. Eventually, she finds the perfect place called the Lesnoy Fox Farm. It's about a 12-hour overnight train ride from Akadem Gordak, where she is. And she plans to go down there four times a year, sometimes for a couple of weeks, other times for a couple of months, every year, to start the experiment. This place, Lesnoy, is a gold mine for the Soviet government. They own it. They own all the fox farms. At any given time, there could be 10,000 foxes at Lesnoy. And they're being bred for shiny fur to export to the West. Ludmila goes down there, and she talks to the director, and she says, I want to test four or 500 animals every year on how nice they are to humans. And the director just looks at her and, like she's crazy. Why would, why would you want to waste your time doing this? when there's so much money in fox fur. But she says, Belayev sent me. That's enough. And he says, fine, go ahead. So she develops this routine. Six o'clock in the morning, she starts. And she goes methodically from fox cage to fox cage. And she's going to test on any given year about four or 500 foxes. And she's going to test them twice, once when they're a pup and then once when they're an adult. And the tests are very simple. She is going to score them on how friendly they are or not towards her. First, when she approaches their cage. Then, when she stands by the closed cage. Then she'll score them on how friendly or aggressive they are when she opens the cage. And finally, they'll get a score for how they behave when she puts something inside the cage. And they're scored on a scale of one to four. And high numbers mean relatively calm, and low numbers mean relatively aggressive. So they get a composite score for these things. And then they're tested once when they're a pup like this, and then once when they're an adult. And then every generation from these four or 500 foxes that she's going to test, she's going to take the 10% that are calmest, most friendly to humans, and breed them. And they'll produce the pups for the next generation. 
Now, at the start, these were essentially wild foxes. Ludmilla describes them as fire-breathing dragons for the most part. But there was variation. Some of them were really fire-breathing dragons, and others were a little calmer, a little less aggressive. Foxes like this one here, Laska, who was calm enough in just the second year of the experiment that Ludmilla could pick her up and hold her, giving Ludmilla hope that the experiment might work. So she does this year after year after year, choosing the calmest, tamest ones. Remembering that what constitutes a calm, pro-social fox is going to change as the experiment changes. She's starting off with pretty much wild foxes. So the ones that are in the top 10%, the friendliest ones, they're just not particularly aggressive towards her. But as the experiment goes on, to make that top 10%, you're going to have to be calmer and calmer and calmer if the experiment works. So by the fifth year, she's come up with this classification system. So there are these class three foxes, and these are animals that either flee when Ludmilla comes toward them, or they're aggressive, and they never make the top 10%. There are class two foxes. These are like Laska. Ludmilla could hold these foxes and handle them, but they didn't really show any emotional response towards her. And then there were a few by 1965, the fifth year in, the fifth generation, there were a few of these class one foxes. These not only could be held, but they displayed emotions towards Ludmilla. They would wag their tails when she approached them. They would whine the way that your dog whines when you leave. In 1965, they made maybe 2% of the population. Today, they make up 80%. Almost all the foxes then in this year were class two and a few that were class one. A year later, there's a breakthrough. And Ludmilla has to come up with another category that she refers to as the class one elites. And I'll let her words describe what she found. So this is the sixth generation. Lemille says there appeared pups that eagerly sought contact with humans, not only wagging their tails, but also whining, whimpering, and licking our hands in a dog-like manner. What's more, in this generation, they weren't just wagging their tails. Some of the class one foxes were wagging their curly tails. The first of those domestication syndrome traits to appear in the foxes. Foxes don't normally have curly tails. Now the first of those domestication syndrome traits has appeared. Remembering that they're only selected based on their behavior, not whether they have a curly tail. But now we're starting to see some animals with curly tails in the, among those elite class one foxes. So a couple of years later, Belayev has now secured the space to build a big experimental farm right in Akadem Gordok, where they can do, move the experiment right there. And they could do it every day. This is what the experimental farm looks like on a nice day in the Siberian winter. Each one of those sheds you're looking at might hold 50 or so foxes. And Having this place was really important to Ludmilla because it means that now she doesn't have to limit herself to just going down there to Les Noy four times a year, even if it's for a few months or even a, uh, or a few weeks or a few months. Now she could work every day with her team on the foxes. So she brings in other scientists now. The other thing that was really important to Ludmila about having the farm there in Akadem Gordok was that Belayev was so busy that he could maybe get down to Lesnoy once a year for a day or two. But now, he was just a 20-minute drive away from the experimental farm. 
So she could talk with him and visit with him, discuss new ideas anytime she wanted to. And he could come and interact with the foxes when he wanted to. And if something really special, something really important happened, Ludmila could call him up and get him over there right away. And a couple of years later, one of those really special, important things happened. And it's this fellow right here. Mehta, or dream. Mehta was the first of the domesticated foxes with floppy ears. So typically, when a fox is born, for the first six weeks or so, their ears are floppy. But then they shoot up straight the way that you envision a fox in the wild. At six weeks, Mehta's ears were still drooping. At eight weeks, they were drooping. At 12 weeks, they were drooping. At 16 weeks, they were still drooping. Ludmila calls Belayev out there, and Belayev looks at Dream and turns to Ludmila and says, what kind of wonder is this? Now, another one of the traits in the domestication syndrome, right? not just calmer, friendlier animals, but now calmer, friendly animals with curly tails and floppy ears. Belayev used to show pictures, slides of dream at conferences he would give across the Soviet Union and starting to give around the world now on the fox domestication experiment. And his colleagues would literally accuse him of trying to stick up a picture of a dog puppy to convince them that the fox experiment was working. That's how much Mehta looked like a dog. Remembering always that the only thing that matters when they're choosing which foxes are going to breed is how friendly they are. Not if they have floppy ears, not if they have curly tails. These things are coming along for the ride. So the experiment goes on year after year after year. So let's move into the mid, early to mid-1970s. So they've been measuring, Ludmila and her team have been measuring lots of hormone levels. By 1974, so about 15 generations into the experiment, the stress hormone levels of the domesticated foxes are 50% lower than typical wild foxes. And they're starting to see a whole suite of new things appear in those domesticated foxes. The domesticated pups are opening up their eyes a day earlier on average compared to wild foxes. They're responding to sounds two days earlier on average than wild foxes. When you talk to Ludmila and she takes off her geneticist hat, she will tell you that they used to sit around over tea when this was happening and joke around that it almost seemed like the domesticated pups just could not wait to start interacting with humans. Another thing they saw was that domesticated females, especially the elites, had a slightly longer reproductive season. So typically, wild foxes, late January to early February, for 10 days, they're in its mating season. Domesticated foxes started breeding a couple of days earlier and went a couple of days later. Nothing dramatic, but, but quite significant. Instead of having about a 10-day window where they bred, it was like 14 days. This is another one of those traits in the domestication syndrome. Domesticated species tend to have longer reproductive periods than their wild ancestors. Sometimes domesticated species even have multiple reproductive periods during the same year. They were starting to see all sorts of strange color patterns appear. Yet another one of the domestication syndrome traits, lots of variation in coat color. And one in particular caught their attention. Many of the elite domesticated foxes had this weird white star-shaped pattern that appeared on their foreheads. If any of you know about horses, this is sometimes something you see in horses, and you see it in other domesticated species as well. Now it was appearing in domesticated foxes, and many, many, many other traits. 
So by the early 1970s, the experiment was working, and it was working faster than Ludmila Obrelaev ever thought possible. And all of the evidence suggested that their experiment in genetics, selecting the calmest, tamest ones, that's what was driving all this change. In the early 1970s, they expanded the experiment. They're now going to have another group of foxes. They're always going to keep going on the domestication side. They're going to test hundreds of foxes, choose the top 10%, and that's going to be the domesticated foxes. Now, they're going to choose on the other end of that continuum. And they're going to have another group of foxes, and these are going to be the foxes that are the 10% that were most aggressive towards humans. Same behavioral scale, top 10% go into the domesticated group, lower 10% go into this new group, the aggressive foxes. They weren't that interested in aggression per se. They created this aggressive line to help them understand their domesticated foxes. And there's lots of ways that the aggressive foxes allow them to do this. But I'm going to focus on one. Anytime you do the kind of experiment they were doing, an experiment in behavioral genetics, because it's genetics, but you're selecting on behavior, right? it's always trickier than other kinds of genetics. Because you're always worried that some non-genetic factors are affecting behavior. So, for example, maybe the domesticated foxes behave pro-socially and friendly towards humans because they learn it from their parents. Not because they have an inherent genetic predisposition, but because they learn it. Or maybe the domesticated foxes are friendly towards humans because of some combination of hormones that they're exposed to during the, the development that's different than the hormones that aggressive foxes are exposed to during their development. And you're always worried about these non-genetic factors when you do behavioral genetics. Creating the aggressive fox group allows Ludmila to test and make sure that the results they're seeing are due to genetics, not due to some of these non-genetic factors, like what kind of hormones you might be exposed to during development. So, to do this, you run what's called a transplant experiment. It's also known as a common garden experiment, but now the common garden is going to be the uterus of a fox. So here's what Ludmila did. She had pairs of, fox, pairs of foxes, and they were pregnant females. And in every pair, one was a pregnant tame fox, domesticated fox, one was a pregnant aggressive fox despite the fact that no one had ever tried this, she learned the very intricate, complicated method for transferring early embryos from one fox uterus to another. So here's what the uterine horn of a fox looks like. So each one of those that you're looking at here, each one of those eggs is a developing embryo. So, you know, they have somewhere like six or seven developing embryos in their uterus. What Ludmila did was she took one week old embryos that were, you know, you couldn't even see them with your bare eye, and she transferred them. And what she did was she moved half of the developing embryos from one uterus to the other, right? So she took half of the developing embryos of an aggressive fox, half of the developing embryos of a tame fox moved those over here and those over there. So now each pregnant female had about half of her developing, uh, uh, half of the, uh, of the embryos developing were her genetic embryos, and the other half were foster embryos that had been transferred by Ludmilla, both in the aggressive mother and the tame mother. And she had about six pairs like this. This is the perfect thing to do if you want to know for sure that what you're finding are, is the result of genetics, not due to non-genetic factors. Because now what you can do is when the pups are born, 
you can see how do they behave. Right? Do they behave like their genetic mother or do they behave like their foster mother? So, for example, do the developing embryos that Ludmila moved over from a tame mom to the aggressive mom, when they're born, having developed in the uterus of an aggressive mother, do they behave like their genetic mother or do they behave like their foster mother? If they behave like their genetic mother, regardless of whether they happen to develop in her uterus or somewhere else, then you know the results you're looking at are due to genetic changes. If they behave like their foster mother, then you're not so sure. So, Ludmila sets up the experiment, but she has a little bit of a problem. And the problem is this. When she moves the embryos from one uterus to the other, she knows who's who. But how in the world is she going to know who's who when they're born? The foxes themselves provide the answer because fur coloration is very tightly controlled genetically. So if your mother has dark fur, you have dark fur. If your mother has light fur, you have light fur. So Mila could color code the mothers and know what color, by based on looking at the pups, what color fur they had, then she knew if they were either the genetic offspring or the foster offspring. So she's waiting. At this time, I just want to take a, mention quickly a, a, an important group of people that are involved in this experiment. There's Ludmila and all the scientists. But there are a whole team of dozens of people that Ludmila refers to as sort of the workers. Right? You have 700 foxes. Somebody has to feed those foxes. Somebody has to change the bedding in their cages. Somebody has to do the everyday work of keeping them healthy. That's what the workers did. And the workers tended to be poor women from a local village. These women, they didn't understand the details of the experiment, but they understood it was important science. And they often went far beyond the call in order to help with the experiment. And it was the workers that first saw the pups being born. And they ran to Ludmila's office with cake and wine and had a giant celebration that the pups were born. And now Ludmila, a couple of weeks later, when they're up and walking around, she could watch the pups and see what they do. So here's the results of, of one of these transplants. And I'm going to talk to you about the pups that were born to an aggressive mom. And this is in Ludmila's own words. So it was fascinating. The aggressive mother had both tame and aggressive offspring. That was because of the transplant experiment. Half of them were her own genetic offspring, and half of them were foster offspring. Her foster tame offspring were barely walking. But if there was a human standing by, they were already rushing to the cage doors and wagging their tails, just like their genetic mother. The aggressive mother was punishing her foster tame pups for such, I love this phrase, improper behavior. She growled at them, picked them up, threw them into the back of the cage. What did they do but get up, walk to the front of the cage, and try to lick Ludmila's hands again? They behaved exactly like their genetic mothers, not like their foster mother. Okay. That's half of the pups that were born. Now the other half, which are the aggressive mother's genetic offspring, same cage with this, that mother there. Again, in Ludmila's words, what did they do? I love this phrase too. They retained their dignity, growling aggressively, the same as their mothers and running to the nest. They behave like their genetic mom. When she looked at the pups born to a tame mother rather than this aggressive mother, same thing. The pups behave like their genetic mother, not like their foster mother. Very strong evidence that we're looking at genetic change. So experiments going on and on. And in the mid-70s, 
Ludmila decides to see just how far down the path of domestication these foxes have come. So she goes to Belayev with this audacious idea. She says, there's this little house on the experimental farm. I want to move in there with one of the tame females and live with them the way that we live with our dogs. Up to now, everything has been tightly controlled the way you want to do an experiment. But during the domestication of wolves to dogs, we, we lived with the animals, proto-dogs, as it was happening. Ludmila wanted to know what would happen if she lived with the tame foxes, just how domesticated had they become. So she goes to Belayev, says, I'm going to move in the house with one of these tame foxes, and I'll take notes every day on what happens. And I'll live with her for months, maybe years, and see what it teaches us. And she has the perfect fox in mind, a fox whose name is Pushinka, which means tiny ball of fuzz. Ever since Pushinka could walk at about two and a half weeks, she was the friendliest of all the foxes in the 15 years the experiment had gone on. And Ludmila knew she was the one. But she waited till Pushinka, and we see a picture here of Pushinka being panted by Belayev. She waited till Pushinka was a year old. And then she mated Pushinka with one of the elite males. And now the idea was she would move into the house about a week before Pushinka was due to have pups. So she would take notes on what Pushinka was doing, but she would also take notes on fox pups that from the moment they were born were interacting with humans the way that we interact with dog pups. This is the experimental house. It still stands today. If you go inside, all you see is rubble. The reason I'm showing you that is because the first time I was there in Novosibirsk, it was January of 2012, and it was minus 40, and there was three feet of snow on the ground. But 80-year-old Ludmila insisted upon walking me through the house, room by room, telling me, this is where Pushinka used to lie down next to my bed. This is where we used to play ball with the pups. This is where we used to do that. They moved into the house on April 6th. I'm sorry, so they moved in a week before that. Pushinka gives birth to six pups on April 6th, including this little guy here, Pushak, which is the male version of Tiny Ball of Fuzz. She would take notes on everything they did, games, whatever they did. So they're living together, month after month, and she's there 24-7 with them, taking notes. And three months pass, and it's July. And now, this picture is from the winter. But in the summer, in July, Siberia can get really quite warm. It can get to be 30 degrees Celsius outside. So every night in the summer, Ludmila would sit outside on a little bench reading a book because it was so hot. Now, for those three months that they lived together, people were coming into the house all the time. Pushinka and her pups had never once interacted in an aggressive, negative way with humans in that time. Then on July 15th, Ludmila was sitting outside behind the house on a little bench reading a book. And Pushinka was lying by her side the way that she always did. And, you know, Ludmila would be reading and she'd be petting Pushinka once in a while like you would with your dog. And that night, there was a new watchman who would come around and just make sure everything was okay on the experimental farm. New. Nobody knew who they were. And when that watch person approached... Ludmila looked down, and she could not believe what happened. Pushinka had jumped up, bolted, and charged towards the watchman and began barking exactly the way that a guard dog barks. And foxes do not bark. Never had she heard a fox make that sound. And her first thought was, Pushinka's protecting me. <laughs> 
But then she said, wait a minute, I'm a trained scientist. I know how easy it is to fall into that trap and think the animal is doing what a human would be doing. But then, when Ludmila began talking to the guard in a calm, friendly way, and it was clear that she wasn't in danger, Pushinka stopped barking, slowly walked back over and sat down by the bench waiting for Ludmila to start petting her again. Is it possible that Pushinka wasn't protecting Ludmila? Of course it's possible. But Ludmila will tell you from that night forward, she knew the foxes had come down that path of domestication far enough that she could never leave the experiment because you become responsible forever for what you have tamed, and she never has. Let me just quickly touch on a couple of other incredible things they found more recently. So I mentioned before that the, the, the domesticated fox had a slightly longer reproductive period. But in the early 1980s, something remarkable happened. One year, a few, just three or four or so, of the elite domesticated females were ready to breed a second time during the year, not just in January, but in September. And Ludmila found a few of the elite males that would breed with them. And those females produced a second clutch of pups, never heard of in foxes before. But this is the sort of thing that's associated with domestication. Longer reproductive periods and also sometimes multiple reproductive periods. Wolves only breed once a year, but dogs breed lots, many can breed many times during the year. A small number of the foxes were doing that. Think about how incredible the changes to the female's reproductive system have to be to allow for that. All as the result of selection on behavior and only behavior. As we move forward, by the early 80s and into the 90s, they had some sophisticated machinery that allowed them to measure the faces and bodies of the foxes. And what they found was the domesticated foxes were beginning to look eerily like dogs. When you think of a fox in the wild, you think of that long snout. Domesticated foxes, and I'm trying to, I have to go, I know, I'll try to do it on both sides, have rounder, shorter, more dog-like snouts. The other thing you might think of when you think of a fox in the wild is they have those very thin, gracile limbs that they run around on. Domesticated foxes are sort of chunkier and lower to the ground. All of those changes also do to selection on behavior and only behavior. If we go even closer to the modern day, Ludmila has been working with molecular geneticists, one in particular by the name of Anna Kukova. And so Anna approached Ludmila um, in the late 1990s about doing some molecular genetics work. And she learned something that everybody who works with Ludmila learns, which is that if you can help her understand those domesticated foxes, she will begin working with you. And she will do so at a rate that will make your head spin. And so they began taking blood samples and doing molecular genetic analyses on the domesticated foxes. And they found all sorts of things, and, and, but I just want to talk about one here. So they started off by asking this question. We've got all these changes that we're seeing in the domesticated foxes. At the genetic level, deep down, are those genetic changes kind of spread all over the foxes genome across many, many different chromosomes, or are they localized? Do you find it in, in a hot spot associated with domestication? That was their first question. And what they found was that certainly not all of the underlying genetic changes, but many of them were associated with just a couple of chromosomes. Most uh, uh, the early work suggested Fox chromosome 12 in particular. For the biologists out there, there are a couple of QTLs here that are really important. But, but, but basically what they found was that many of the underlying molecular genetic changes had occurred localized in one place, Fox chromosome 12. There is this kind of hot spot. Right? That's interesting. Didn't have to be that way. More interesting is that at the same time, dog geneticists were asking the same question about dog domestication. So without getting too technical, foxes and dogs have different numbers of chromosomes. 
Fox chromosome 12 is essentially spread over three dog chromosomes. And lo and behold, many of the changes associated with dog domestication occurs on one of these chromosomes. So it's, it looks like they're, they're truly mimicking this process of, that, that occurred when our ancestors domesticated wolves into dogs. And there's all sorts of new stuff coming out, particular genes that might be of interest. The last six months, there's been a whole bunch of papers on this. Last thing. Right? I want to tell you my, maybe my favorite trait about the domesticated foxes. Now, this is the newest thing they discovered. They've only known about this for about 10 years. And before I tell you what it is, I want to tell you why I love this so much. The first thing is, think about it. They only found this about 10 years ago. Right? That means the experiment had been going on almost 50 years before this appeared. If any one of us in the audience worked on a system for 30 years, we could start collecting our lifetime achievement awards, and we wouldn't have even come close to working on it long enough to see this. This is, tells us the power of long-term experiments. The other reason I love this trait is it's hard to imagine anything more wonderful in a pet-like animal. So here's what happened. Um, a, a woman by the name of Svetlana Gogolova, who is an animal behaviorist at Moscow State University, and she studies the sounds, the vocalizations that all sorts of animals make. And she approached Ludmila and said, I'd like to come there and study the vocalizations that the, the tame fox, the domesticated foxes make and the aggressive foxes make, and, and just see what I, can, what I can discover. And Ludmila said, sure. So Svetlana came year after year. She got about 2,000 hours of tapes of these animals. And basically, if you look across all the foxes, the tame foxes and the aggressive foxes, they make about eight different sounds. But it turns out that the domesticated foxes make two sounds that no other foxes make. Okay? And I want to talk about one of them. Right? This is a sound that... Domesticated foxes make, and aggressive foxes don't make, and wild foxes don't make. Domesticated, almost all of domesticated foxes make this sound, and they almost all make it from when they're pups. And here's what it sounds like. Oh, come on. Can you hear that? Okay. There is no non-human sound that is closer to human laughter than that sound you're listening to. If you put it on a spectrogram where you visualize sound and you put it up against human laughter, nothing is closer than that. It's almost too nice, right? Not only do you have these loving, caring foxes that look like dogs, they also make laughing-like sounds, both when you want to laugh and also when you don't, because, of course, they're not making this in respect to anything going on. They're just making this sound. It's exactly the sort of thing you'd like to have in your pet. It's the one, it's the trait they understand least. They don't know why or how domesticated foxes make this and why the other foxes don't, but they're working on it. So if you ask Ludmilla today, 59 years later, after she started, what are her hopes and dreams? Um, I asked her, there's a six hour answer version and then there's the version I'll give you, which is just highlighting a couple of things that she wants and hopes for. The first one is, she says, I hope that it's possible to register them as a new pet species. So they, they essentially are a pet species, but technically, in order to be a house pet, you have to go through um, an international group that certifies that. Otherwise, you're considered an exotic species, and that's what they're considered now. The thing about that means that there are maybe a couple of dozen of these foxes living in people's houses around the world. You can buy them. They're extremely expensive, and all the money, though, goes right to the experiment. But, you know, it depends. I don't know what the rules are. 
for the Netherlands. They're probably different than the rules for the United States, which are probably different than the rules from France and different from the rules in England. When it's an exotic species, it varies. It probably, I wouldn't be surprised, and now in the United States, it varies from state to state whether it allowed you, you can have these foxes when they, because they're considered exotic. I, I bet it differs from Amsterdam to here. But when you get them officially registered as a pet species, then they can be anywhere. And our hope is that that'll happen. They're working on it. They could keep the experiment going, and they will, and still have dozens, if not a couple of hundred foxes that they could put in people's houses every year. Because they are pets, and they do eventually want lots of them to be in people's houses. They're working on it. The other thing Ludmila will tell you is, one day I'll be gone, but I want my foxes and the experiment to live forever. I do, and I hope you do as well. And thank you very much for staying this long on a cold night. And as we take questions, I will show you a few, oh, a few domesticated foxes playing in the snow in Novosibirsk. Aren't they beautiful? Yeah. OK, thank you very much. We have time for questions. About half an hour, I guess. So, who would be the first? Yeah, over there. So, thank you very much for your talk. You're welcome. Um, I have a quick question. Can it be that selecting calm and good behavior of the foxes is a bit biased by unconsciously still seeing a slightly curved tail or a slightly more floppy ear? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, I, you know, that was perhaps a bigger problem early on when Ludmila alone was involved in the experiment. Over the years, they have basically taken a lot of the tools that psychologists use, because psychologists have this problem all the time when they study human behavior. And there are lots of things you can do to minimize it. So for example, you can have multiple observers and then you can cross and see if they both are rating things exactly the same. It's also a much more complicated system than that four-step process that I talked to you about with Ludmila. Today, they measure dozens of different things about the foxes. And so between that and having multiple observers where you correlate to see if, if individuals are consistently choosing the same foxes, you minimize that to the, you know, to the extent that you can. I mean, you, that's the best you can do when, when you work with these kinds of experiments. They certainly are consciously you know, choosing based on behavior and not paying attention to the curly tails, but you, you, know, you always have to worry about these unconscious biases. And they do what they can to minimize that. Um, and so I, I would say also, that's why things like the cross-fostering experiment are so important. Yeah, yeah, I really like that one. Yeah. It's very yeah, interesting. It, and that's one that almost no one knows about because it's in, even by Soviet journal standards, it was an obscure journal that they published that in. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know why the, the floppy tails and the curled uh, tail, wait, the curled tails and the floppy ears uh, involved? Is it just coincidence or? Um, do we have another hour? No, yes, okay. <laughs> so, um, hmm. Yes, um, so I, I'm not going to get into this, but there is a, um, a, a theory that deals with a kind of stem cell known as a neural crest cell. And um, let, me, let me just actually get to a nice picture here, sorry. Um, these neural crest cells, because they're a stem-like cell, they can develop into almost any kind of cell in an adult fox. And they, they're involved in almost every one of the traits that we've been talking about. So they're involved in cartilage, which has something to do with curly ears and floppy tails. They turn into melanocytes, so they have something to do with the coloration. They're involved in the facial structure. They're involved in almost everything that's part of the domestication syndrome. And here's what we know, and we being you know, not me, but, 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 but people who have worked on this in developmental biology, because they're kind of stem cell developmental biologists have been interested in this in a long time. Turns out 
that when you choose for calm, friendly behavior, you are also choosing for fewer neural crest cells. And they migrate out to, be, to all these different parts of the body. That's a dog, but, it, but it's true for a fox too. And the changes to having fewer neural crest cells migrating map nicely onto almost all of the domestication syndrome traits. So that's the working hypothesis. Select on behavior. One of the things you're doing is decreasing the number of these important cells that move out to become all sorts of characteristics in the adult animal in a way that creates the other traits in the domestication syndrome. That's the working hypothesis. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, hi, thanks uh, also for me. Great talk. Um, so you've talked a lot about the physical characteristics uh, that accompany uh, the domestication. What about, um, shall we call them the mental capabilities, mm -hmm. the fox's capacity to learn, nice. to be trained? Um, did you notice any patterns there? Yeah. We really should have had a two-hour version of this, because I, yes, yes, so they, so yes. Um, there's a fellow by the name of Brian Hare, who is an expert in dog behavior and evolution. And Brian went and spent some time with the foxes, and he did this incredible experiment on, in what's known as social cognition. So one of the things that's really special about dogs and was probably really important while we were domesticating them is that they're good at following human gaze and human pointing. Wolves are not that good and almost everything else is awful. Like chimps, just they don't know what the hell's going on. But, but, but dogs are really good at that and we think that that was really important in the domestication process. So Brian went and he did some experiments with following gaze and touching. He did it with the domesticated foxes, and he did it with the aggressive foxes, and he did it with a control line that they have that's essentially like a wild fox. Domesticated foxes are as good, if not better, than dogs. Aggressive foxes and wild foxes don't know what the heck's going on, right? So they appear to be one of the side effects of choosing on behavior is in terms of cognition, they seem to be better at these kinds of social cognition things, like where you have to pay attention to what other organisms are doing. Um, they haven't done any. They haven't done any classic kind of um, Pavlovian or Skinner-like experiments where you basically try and train a fox to push something so food comes down. And I asked Ludmila why they didn't do this. And I, I just, I remember sitting across the table and she just looked at me and she said, well, we want to, we tried. Here's the problem. For that kind of experiment, the, all the animals have to view the value of something as the same, right? So the, the issue is that if you try to teach them to press something down and get a piece of food, the aggressive foxes are really good at that because they don't care about people. But if you do that experiment and there's a human around, all the domesticated foxes wanna do is lick you and have you pick them up. They don't value, they value that interaction more than they value the food. Now in principle, there's a way around it. If you could automate the whole thing so that no humans were involved at all in the process, then you might be able to test it. My guess is, that would not work. Because even if you put them in a room where it was all automated, my guess is that what you would have are the domesticated foxes rubbing up against the door because they know that people put them in there and there are people on the other side of that door. So that, that's the reason they haven't done classic, but the social cognition stuff is really important and they have done that. There is actually some evidence that ravens can also follow gaze. Ravens? Ravens. So the, these birds are incredibly oh, smart. Oh, I, I am not, I mean, I'm not surprised. I mean, like they, you know, yeah. No, no, they, but it would I, be nice for another studium time. generale. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you.
I want to ask you something about uh, pup, pup behavior and adult behavior. Can you tell something about that? What social behavior is more like pups do and adults less. Uh, is there a change in that uh, by wild animals? There's a, a border between pup stadium and adult stadium. Yeah, so I um, uh, I was sort of emphasizing when it came to like juvenile, younger characteristics, I was emphasizing that their faces and their bodies, so their faces are actually sort of more pup-like than, than a normal fox is. So when they're pups, regular foxes do have a more rounded snout and it becomes longer during development. That's also true for their behavior. So many of the traits that you see in the domesticated foxes are what biologists call neoteny. They're, they're retaining juvenile characteristics. So for example, the domesticated foxes have much lower stress hormone levels. And you could imagine how that makes interacting with humans much easier. Normally, if you go to, if you, if you, if you work with wild foxes and you measure their stress hormone levels, they actually have relatively low stress hormone levels right up until the age when they start becoming more independent and not reliant on their mother, which makes perfect sense. You don't have to worry about things the same way when your mother is taking care of you. When, you're, when you start to be independent, then you have to be paying attention and, and much more stressed about predators and finding food. So the domesticated foxes, again, are, are retaining this juvenile characteristic. In wild foxes, they have low stress hormone levels, and then they get really high when they become independent. The, the domesticated foxes are essentially holding on to that juvenile characteristic. And that translates into them being behaviorally more like pups than adults. Does that answer the question? Um, do you think also that part of the behavior could be due to epigenetics, or do you think it's just genetics? I mean, if you swap the youngsters, they still have been for a certain period with the real mother. Um, so I got the first part. The last part was if you do what? If yeah, you... You, you have this cross-foster experiment, and it shows genetics, but it could also still oh, be partly yeah. uh, epigenetics yeah. because so, it has been with the mother eh, for right. some time. Um, well... Epigenetics means a lot of different things to different people. Um, but there is a real strong epigenetic component, and, that, and this is what they've been finding, and the, there's been a couple of nice papers about this. Basically, what they know is that many of the changes in the domesticated animals, some of them are sort of the classic evolutionary changes, meaning if you look at how common this gene is or that gene is in the domesticated foxes, it's different than in the aggressive foxes. That explains some of the difference, but a lot of it is not that there are different genes involved, but the genes are being turned on and turned off at different times. And there's lots and lots of work to suggest that the domesticated foxes have a whole suite of genes that are turned on earlier and turned off at different times than the, tame, than the aggressive foxes. That's a kind of epigenetics, and that is really important in these foxes. Uh, yeah. Have they found any difference between when comparing aggressive foxes and uh, domesticated ones on the between foxes behavior? This is a great question. We were talking about this at dinner, and this is, I think, sort of the most bizarre, unexplained part of the experiment. So they haven't done a lot, okay, but they have done some e behavioral experiments where they put two foxes together and just let them interact with each other. And if you put two foxes together long enough, one of them will be dominant, and the other one will be submissive and subordinate to it. So they've put aggressive foxes and tame foxes together. Now, you would think, or I would think, that the aggressive fox would always end up at the top there, because they have, for example, they have um, much higher testosterone levels, much, um, they're, they're much more um, aggressive in general. Right? Well, they have much higher testosterone levels. And 
So you would think that would translate, but it doesn't. So basically, one of those two foxes will be dominant and the other will be submissive, but it doesn't, it's not correlated with whether you're aggressive or domesticated. And, and that makes, that's why I like, the term aggressive there is very confusing. I'm using the word aggressive in the sense that those animals were chosen based on if they're aggressive to humans. But when you put them with other foxes, they're not more or less aggressive with other foxes. That's really surprising, given all of the underlying hormonal changes. And I, you know, I, we, I, I'm not sure that I have a good explanation for it. We talked a little bit about it at, at dinner, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> adding to this question, this, this, uh, this selection line for, for aggression and the selection line for domestication, how does that relate to things that have been known about the natural variation in normal populations of, of the foxes? Any idea of the, of the natural variation in, variation in nature? Not a great deal of information. So I, you know, when I was talking about those foxes that Ludmilla worked with at the start in 1960, they're, they're close, but they're not really wild foxes because they are the result of fur breeding experiments. Now, those experiments are not designed to choose the calmest animals, but indirectly, they probably have had some effects like that. Um, in that population, the vast majority of the animals at the start were very aggressive um, or um, they, they, they fled when Ludmilla came. And only a very small proportion showed anything that would be considered even neutral behavior. But there's not a lot of work that's been done on the wild populations. My guess is it would be sort of like what they had at the start of the 1960, but it's hard to say for sure. So, but there is no hint for coping, different coping strategies, the, the more aggressive one, the more socializing. There is no, right, we just don't know whether or not all of that, all of the interesting work that's been done sort of mapping personalities onto animals, we don't know about that in natural populations of foxes. I'm not even sure, yeah, I don't know how much we know about natural populations of canines, period, but I know that with the, wild, with the foxes, they don't know a lot in nature. Well, we know some um, in great tits, but that's of course. I, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Right. I know, like that. In, but in canines, I'm not sure how much they know about it in 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 the wild. If we did, and we knew about the coping strategies in more detail, maybe we could sort of make more sense out of that finding where they're aggressive to humans, but they're not more aggressive to other foxes. There has been done work on hyenas and wolves a little bit on this. Um, in the back, there was a question for a long time, yeah. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, I was wondering, um, how are the differences between the genetically tame um, foxes, but when they were uh, uh, what was reared by uh, tame foxes, like in the foster experiments with the different uh, treatments? It's related to the question about um, Epigenetics, but the other aspect of epigenetics. Right, that, that, that experiment really is a, another aspect of epigenetics. I agree with you completely. And all I did was talk to you a little bit about what they did right away. You know, when, when, they, when, when they were basically old enough to walk and Ludmilla started watching their behavior. Um, she says that, you know, when they were taking records, those animals throughout their development behaved like their genetic mother even when they were raised, you know, not just immediately, but continually by a foster mother. And, and oftentimes, like you saw, at least with the aggressive foster mother, they were in fact being punished for, for, for some, and they still did it. Um, and they did that, you know, basically throughout their entire development. They behaved like their genetic mother, not like their foster mother. Strongly suggesting that that kind of epigenetic maternal effect is, is not critical for, the, for, for explaining what's going on with these foxes. If it was, then you would expect that at least there would be some evidence that they were sort of, maybe they were like their genetic mother, but, but, but also showed some tendencies of their foster mother, but they don't. Now, we have a few more questions in the back, even behind you. 
Have they done uh, similar experiments with other animals than foxes? Yeah. Uh, we should have given me three hours. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Um, uh, so where that experimental farm is, there are, like I said, six or 700 foxes. And a lot of people go there these days. You know, like a lot of researchers visit, and they're also getting to be quite famous. Everybody who goes to the farm goes to the foxes. But on the other side of the farm, they have been doing for 45 years a parallel experiment exactly doing the same thing with mink, creating a domesticated line and an aggressive line. And the results are remarkably similar to the foxes. Not quite as sexy because they're smaller, so the differences are not as magnified. But, well, first you get strong responses to behavioral selection. So you get really, I mean, I, I interacted with these animals, and, and, the, and the domesticated ones, you open up their cage, and they will literally walk up your arm and sit on your shoulder. No training, just that's, that's the way they act. I mean, I still have nightmares about walking by those cages of the ones that are on the aggressive line. They're scarier in many ways. They're more demonic than the aggressive foxes. And, and, and they also get the correlated changes in um, um, color, in uh, face, in body shape, again, much more juvenileized kinds of characteristics in the domesticated animals. They have also, the last thing I'll say is that they, they started an experiment there in, in the early 70s doing the same thing in rats. That experiment, um, the person who was working on it is Pavel Borodin. After about five years, he ended up doing other stuff, and that experiment moved to one of the Max Planck Institutes, still going on today, 45 years later. Just recent, and, and of course you get very strong differences in the behavioral selection, but just recently I saw a paper where they did the measurements of the facial measurements and the domesticated rats have a more juvenileized face than the aggressive rats. Again, very parallel to the foxes. They tried, but failed miserably to, to do this with um, sea otters, um, but that's another story. <laughs> Um, so you, do you know if this friendliness trait is like a dominant or a recessive trait? And also another question is, does a friendly female prefer an aggressive male or is there a mate preference in these yeah. kind of experiments? Have you tried that? Sure. Um, with respect to the dominant recessive, we're talking about a lot of different genes that are involved and lots of differences in expression patterns. And so I don't know that there's any, um, I don't know how much evidence there is that many of the genes involved are dominant or recessive. I don't think there's a lot of evidence one way or the other on that. Um, I'd have to look again on that one. Um, the second part was, what was the second part? Um, preference of mates. Oh, oh, preference of mates, right. We, they don't know because these, Ludmilla and her team are, you know, they're population geneticists. They're very, very meticulous. They create the breeding protocol for the experiment. So females do not have the choice between that male or that male. Ludmilla and the team choose who's going to mate with who. Um, they, you know, in principle, they could do that experiment, but I don't think there's any uh, data on it one way or the other. It would be very interesting because, um, you know, I'm not sure, given what I told you about what happens when you just put two same-sex individuals together, I'm not really sure that they would show assortative mating or, or not. It's, it's hard to say. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I think we should uh, end here because uh, we have to leave the room at half past nine. <laughs> but before we do that, I think we really should thank the speaker very much. I think uh, very much... Uh, thank you for sharing this very intriguing story in such a nice and enthusiastic way. I think actually you should give your talk for our policy makers. Because <laughs> nowadays, you know, it's so hard to get funding for long-term research. Yes. Because, you know, they don't right. like to have the risk. And this in is the case poster. They don't know beforehand what the right. results are. This should be a poster for how, why long-term experiments are important. Right. I, I agree with you completely. <laughs>
Okay. okay. But before we go, yes. um, you might step down if you like. Okay, yeah, I feel, I, yeah, I'm not used to, I feel like I should be giving a sermon up there, so I, I'm going <laughs> The tradition is that uh, we hand over a token of our gratitude oh. that you would be uh, willing to come over all the way from the USA. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, and let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out on a, on a cold night. I really appreciate it.